Uh, look, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the economic security session. Uh, and after the, the keynote speech, we'll have a panel discussion, so please get your questions ready. Uh, but it's my privilege and honour to introduce Professor Shujiro Urata, who's chairman of RIETI, the Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry. That's attached to the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. Um, but Urata Sensei is well known to many of us here in Australia, but globally, of course. I'll just read out some of his current roles. That's a much longer list. Um, but of course, he's Professor Emeritus at Waseda University, where he spent most of his career. He's also a special advisor to the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia area in Jakarta, a visiting fellow at the Asian Development Bank Institute, specially appointed fellow at the Japan Center for Economic Research, the Nikkei Center, distinguished senior fellow, Institute of Developing Economies, uh, and many more. And we've asked Urata-san to talk about economic security in Japan because we're all trying to figure out uh, what the, the front runner in this field is doing, and Japan is definitely a front runner. Uh, and Urata Sensei is the doyen of Japanese international economic policy. And for me personally, um, it's a privilege because Urata Sensei was one of my thesis examiners for my PhD. You may not remember that, I hope he doesn't. <laughs> um, but also to note that Urata san did speak at the first Japan update 10 years ago, so it's wonderful to have you back at the update. And please join me in welcoming Urata Sensei. Cheryl-san, uh, thank you very much for a very uh, generous introduction of myself, and I'd like to thank uh, Cheryl-san and Fujiwara-san, Ippe-san, and the Japan, uh, Austria Japan Research Center for uh, inviting me to talk about the uh, uh, economic security. Uh, well, I have to confess that I'm an economist by profession, and but. Uh, of course, you know, many uh, people are now interested in economic security. That's the same all over the world. And so I'm uh, now uh, uh, kind of moving into this area. But I kind of hesitate to uh, speak about this issue in front of experts like Michael Green and Soya-san, Opa-san, and, and so, you know, other experts in this issue, security particularly. And uh, part of my talk uh, comes from a joint study that I did with uh, Shiro Armstrong. So if I make uh, some problematic uh, remarks, uh, <laughs> please you know, ask him about uh, why this is the case. And, uh, and I'm given 20 minutes, and I like to be efficient and effective. So I prepared some notes, and uh, I usually I talk not uh, from notes, but I, like I said, I'm uh, new in this area, and I like to use this time effectively, efficiently. So um, I, I will uh, read some of my. Uh, I mean, I will read some uh, sentences from my notes. Uh, okay. All right. First introduction: Economic globalization. There is no need for me to explain this, but has progressed rapidly. Uh, since the 1990s and brought about high economic growth throughout the world. But the momentum of uh, globalization slowed as protectionist uh, uh, measures were implemented to protect against uh, the negative effects of global financial crisis in 2007-2009. In addition, the trade friction between the United States and China uh, 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 and, and that broke out in the latter half of the 2010s and the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and the military invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia in 2022 have further uh, divided the global economy. And the movement of goods, uh, people, has decreased significantly in recent years. Now, people are, some people are talking about uh, the end of globalization or de-globalization. <clears throat> In an uncertain situation where the complete end of the COVID-19 pandemic, the confrontation between the United States and China, the Russia-Ukraine war cannot be predicted, 
uh, countries around the world have a growing interest in economic security. There seems to be no uh, established definition of economic security, so I kind of uh, I looked into this issue uh, by reading some of the uh, papers, and I found the uh, paper by Matake Kamiya-san. He's, a, I think, an expert in this area. Uh, he has a definition of economic security. Uh, yes, uh, this way. According to him, um, uh, the economic security is defined as the ability of a state <clears throat> to protect its territory, independence, and the lives, of property, the lives and property of its citizens from economic threats. So what are the economic threats? <clears throat> uh, he has three types of economic threats. <clears throat> First type is a case in which unintentional disturbances in the international economic system adversely affect the domestic economy. Supply chain disruption due to COVID-19, natural disasters such as earthquake, uh, it's the example, are the example of this type. And the second type is um, uh, when uh, competitive, competitiveness or advantage of a country is acquired by uh, an enemy country and then used to impose negative impacts on the economy or security of the target uh, country. Uh, this is the second type. Examples include acquisition of a, uh, of a company holding important technology by inward direct investment. Uh, incidentally, this is the issue that I'll be discussing more later, inward direct investment. The third type is a case in which enemy country uh, uses its economic power to intentionally exert a negative impact on the economy or security of the target country. This type of you know, conduct is referred to as economic coercion or uh, economic statecraft by hostile company. So in light of the uh, changing patterns of globalization and growing attention on economic security, uh, I'd like to review the globalization trend of Japan of Japanese economy and recent developments in economic uh, security policy in Japan, and then attempt to make some assessment of Japan's economic security policy. Uh, Japanese economy. Uh, what uh, we are looking at is the uh, trend of globalization in terms of trade and investment. Uh, top two lines res uh, refer, uh, refer to a trade. Uh, to GDP ratio, export and imports. They are rising, oh, kind of a trend. And the uh, two lines bottom are the uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, unbroken line represents outward foreign direct investment to GDP ratio, which is increasing quite sharply. Uh, uh, broken line uh, represents uh, direct investment, inward direct investment into Japan which, as you can see, is not growing, although it's you know, slowly going up. So uh, what is um, uh, uh, special about Japanese globalization is that uh, in terms of trade, I think it's, uh, Japan is somewhat average compared to other countries. No you know, uh, uh, peculiar trend. But when it comes to inward direct investment, uh, Japan is very low, as you can see. Uh, you know, inward uh, direct investment to GDP ratio is only 4.4%, whereas the other countries have a higher value. So, uh, and one notable difference in the characteristics of, in characteristics of inward direct investment uh, in Japan compared to that of other developed countries is low level of mergers and acquisition, M&As relative to greenfield investment. The share of M&A in total inward FDI was around 60 to 70% for many countries, while in Japan it's about 40%. So uh, this is an issue, a uh, very uh, serious issue for Japan, because inward investment could contribute to the recovery of the Japanese economy, uh, which uh, is very 
badly needed. I guess we, 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 we heard from this uh, first session from uh, Mr. Kaizuka about the current situation, very low growth rate. Uh, uh, and realizing the importance of inward foreign direct investment for the Japanese economies to recover or to regain its competitiveness, Japanese government has introduced many uh, uh, policies to attract foreign direct investment, but the gap is still quite big. So this is the situation that uh, we are looking at, and we'd like to see inward direct investment to grow. Now, let me quickly turn to economic security policy for Japan. <clears throat> uh, the growing interest in economic security in Japan in recent years was fostered by the strengthening of the hardline stance uh, toward China in the economic security policy under the US President Trump. Uh, uh, in, uh, and in March oh, right, uh, 2019, uh, the group of LDP politicians uh, headed by Mr. Amari, proposed to establish the Japanese version of the U.S. National Economic Council, NEC, as a control tower, tower for economic security policies. And uh, in May, uh, the same year, 2019, the uh, proposal were com compiled and submitted to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Against this backdrop, Japanese government has advanced the creation of a system for formulating policies with focus on areas where the economy and security overlap, specifically Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and other uh, ministry of Japanese government uh, set up uh, a, a, a team or reorganized its organization to deal with economic security. In April 2020, economic team, uh, the last line, two, two lines, economic team was established within the National Security Bureau of the Cabinet Secretariat as a final stage of development of Japan's economic security system. Among various areas that they cover, the protection of advanced technology is one of the most important responsibilities. Uh, technology targeted for acquisition by non-allied countries include artificial intelligence, technology related to the fifth generation mobile communication system, 5G, and so on. And there are several uh, conceivable methods of acquiring these technologies from Japan. One is acquisition of Japanese companies that own these technologies which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, and the uh, other method includes exploitation of technology from government and private comp companies through cyber attacks. Furthermore, technology leakage, leakage through joint projects with, say, uh, Chinese universities and research institutes is also a serious pro problem. Uh, the Kishida... Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, the Kishida administration, which was inaugurated in September 2021, has a strong interest in economic security. And the, um, they uh, introduced the uh, uh, Act on Promotion of Ensuring Security Through Integrated Economic Measures, or Economic Security Promotion uh, Act, uh, uh, in May 2022, last year. And the, uh, this law requires uh, ensuring a stable supply of important goods, ensuring a stable provision of basic infrastructure services, uh, supporting the development of important uh, uh, cutting-edge technology, and non-disclosure of patent applications. So this is the uh, very brief introduction of economic security uh, policy in Japan. And let me turn to this uh, revision of foreign exchange and foreign trade law. Uh, this is a part of a new economic security policy. And according to the Japanese government, the purpose of this revision uh, is to curb foreign uh, direct investment that threatens national security while promoting healthy 
foreign direct investment that contributes to the growth of the Japanese economy. The revision uh, was passed in May 2020. The revision expanded the scope of investment to which foreign exchange law applies. Before the, before the revision, uh, foreign investors were required to submit prior notification to the government and were subject to review when acquiring 10% or more of the shares of listed companies. Uh, after the revision, the threshold for a prior notification uh, was lowered to 1%, from 10% to 1%. The reason for setting the shareholding ratio to 1% is that if an investor owns 1% uh, of the issued shares, it is possible for them to exercise the right to propose agenda items and to exercise influence over management. <coughs> uh, on the other hand, like I said earlier, uh, this law, according to the Japanese government, is to, uh, to uh, 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 increase attractiveness of the Japanese uh, uh, company and uh, Japanese marketing to foreigners. So, in order to encourage uh, the uh, expansion of uh, safe investment, a system of exemption from prior notification was introduced if certain conditions are met. <laughs> and in May 2020, the Minister of Finance released a list of stocks that require prior uh, uh, notification when acquiring shares. Of the 3,800 listed companies, uh, of the uh, 3,800 listed companies, 2,102 listed companies belong to these designated industries. It's quite a quite large share. So in response to this revision, um, uh, several concerns have been raised about the uh, potential negative impact on inward direct investment into Japan. One is the, uh, one is the uh, let's see, um, many listed companies are now subject to prior notification, as I said earlier. Uh, and the prior notification is exempted if certain conditions are met, but the mere fact that the conditions must be met dampens investment motivation. As this I discussed earlier, Japan has an extremely low level of inward direct investment compared to other countries. Jap Japanese government aims to expand inward direct investment in order to revitalize its economy, but the tightening of regulations due to the revision of the foreign exchange law runs counter to this. In addition, Tightening regulations on foreign direct investment will require, uh, sorry, will reduce competitiveness, uh, competitive pressure on domestic companies, Japanese companies. So, corporate governance reform, uh, which is being expected, will be delayed, and productivity improvement, which will play an important role in strengthening corporate competitiveness and revitalizing economy cannot be expected. So uh, I have discussed the globalization of the Japanese economy, recent developments in economic security policy in Japan. And there, so we have, uh, well, the Japanese government is faced with seemingly two conflicting objectives. On the one hand, uh, they're interested in expanding direct investment in order to uh, 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 recover from a uh, long recession and to achieve high economic growth. On the other hand, they, uh, the Japanese government is keen to restrict foreign direct investment for economic security reasons. So what should be done to achieve these two conflicting, uh, seemingly conflicting uh, objectives? So uh, these are my kind of um, own personal idea, not, nothing to do with Rieti or any other institution that uh, I may represent. So I, I like to see more, less restrictive policy, uh, for example, to increase threshold for prior notification uh, and to not list these companies which are 
uh, like I said, you know, 2,000 plus companies are listed as a possible uh, kind of um, uh, companies where the uh, application for investment is reviewed and so on. That's so re less restrictive policy. But that, of course, will uh, may have a problem on economic security. Uh, and for that, I think Japanese government needs to have um, uh, research and investigation capability uh, regarding advanced technology and foreign investors. The Japanese government has identified advanced and important technology, as I said earlier, and the, uh, and, but I, I may be wrong, but the Japanese government does not seem to have a list of companies which own this technology or, or the list of companies which are able to uh, produce this technology. But Japanese government should have that kind of list and they should not really disclose that list. They can use this list when they screen the uh, uh, application of foreign direct investment. So that's one thing, right? Uh, and the um, Japanese government needs to have a capability to monitor, monitor uh, foreign investors' activities uh, to make sure that the foreign investors do not violate the conditions for getting approval for the entry or uh, uh, make sure that the foreign investors uh, do not really engage in uh, quote unquote kind of illegal activities. Uh, with that, uh, these uh, uh, you know, increasing capability in research and investigation and also uh, capability in monitoring, uh, we can maybe, we are able to restrict uh, 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 negative impacts of, of uh, foreign direct investment on economic security. And finally, if the Japanese government uh, at the moment is not capable of doing so, Japanese government uh, can really uh, cooperate with other governments in this regard. And with this, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Urata Sensei for introducing us to the issues. Um, showing us how Japan has been ahead of, I think, a lot of other countries um, uh, in identifying this, this issue explicitly, making machinery of government changes that you talked about, um, having a minister for economic security even, and coordinating across the various silos in the Japanese system. Um, this, of course, comes from a recognition of a, a more complex, complicated external environment and the weaponization of trade and the weaponization of economic interdependence. Um, this is where we had um, a question early about the definition of economic security, and maybe we can come back to this, and I want to come back to the foreign direct investment issue uh, as well. Fundamentally, I think economic security, um, everyone's throwing all sorts of things into it that they wish, but surely it's about preserving living standards and, and protecting against the threat to those. So that's, that's where I come out on this anyway. But I think to to follow up on Urata-san's presentation uh, and help us answer some of these questions and see what's going on in the uh, on the ground in Japan uh, and with Japan's interactions with China uh, and the rest of the global economy. We're joined by two panelists, uh, distinguished panelists uh, who've flown in from Japan. Uh, and I'll give a brief introduction uh, to our two panelists. The, the fuller bio is in um, uh, the program. Uh, but first, we've got Dr. Richard Dyke, who's owner and president of TGK Japan, um, and uh, many more. Uh, you're on the board of many um, companies. Um, uh, you're on many boards, and that's all listed in the, the bio. But I think we've got you here, Rick, because you're a semiconductor man, and this is right in the middle of all the action um, in the technology decoupling between China and the United States. Uh, and of course, we have Melanie Brock here, who would be familiar to everybody, um, absolutely, uh, who is, of course, Chair Emeritus of the Australian and New Zealand Chamber of Commerce in Japan and um, recently joined the board of Kawasaki Heavy, uh, but also on the board of Mitsubishi Estate, Sega Sami Holdings, but most importantly, the advisory board for the Australia-Japan Research Centre. 
Uh, so with that, uh, let me pass um, the microphone virtually to Rick uh, and for some opening remarks. Thanks. Thank you, Shiro. It's, it's, a, it's a delight to be here. It's my first time in Canberra. Uh, and uh, I felt at home. I felt walking around the area around the university and the, the town. I was like in Kenmore Square near MIT, except it's much cleaner <laughs> <laughs> and much more friendly. Uh, but thank you. Uh, yeah, for Rata Sensei's remarks, which are a bit different than I was thinking about, but one of the things that I also do is that for 20 years I've been involved with a private, private equity fund called Nihon Sangyo Partners, which we've stayed pretty much under the radar screen, but we, I'll get into it, but with the divestiture of Hitachi's uh, subsidiaries and now Toshiba, we're the main fund working on actually taking Toshiba private. So, uh, so it gets sort of directly to some of the things that Rata-san is talking about. One, one thing I will say that in the change in governance in Japan, the fact that I've been on several Japanese boards and Melanie is on two Japanese boards, and actually all of the boards that I have been on have had other non-Japanese on the boards. Uh, so that's a real change. Also, w one thing to discuss is increasingly on the boards, we have uh, the issue of activist shareholders. Some of them are Japanese, but located in Singapore, like the Murakami Fund, Afisimo, uh, Oasis in Hong Kong. In English, they're called activist shareholders. In Japanese, they're called monoyu kabunushi, which means just shareholders that say things. <laughs> <laughs> and many in Japan also say that's not a bad thing. And even on the boards that I am on, we listen to those shareholders because in most cases, we find them constructive. <laughs> the, there's a lot of interest in Japanese companies by overseas investors. And one of the reasons is the Japanese stock market is viewed as undervalued. And one of the examples of that is the priced book ratio of Japanese companies. There's a huge number of companies on even the Tokyo Stock Exchange that have a price book ratio of under 1.0. That means that the market cap is below the, the value of basically the assets of the company. <laughs> Uh, that you could liquidate the company uh, and you'd have, you, you, you'd have liquidation that is higher than the, the market cap. Uh, and that's a problem. And it's a problem in Japan. Uh, it's a problem for METI. It's a, and it's also for a problem for the Tokyo Stock Exchange. There's a lot of pressure for companies to at least get their price book ratio above 1.0. So in, in a way, you're right. There's an inconsistency between lowering the threshold for having to disclose to the Japanese government and the interest to get more activity in, in the market. I'd just like to say something. That there's been a sea change in Japan that perhaps has gone unperceived by the world. But Hitachi is a very good example. Hitachi, NEC, Fujitsu, these are all companies that have basically, that basically became huge by, from the, from the, from having as their customers, NTT, uh, Japan Railways, uh, the, uh, 
the power, uh, the power sector, Bas basically uh, heavily state-controlled uh, companies. So Hitachi, NTT, which was until it was private, bought from four companies, NHOF, NEC, Hitachi, Oki, and Fujitsu. All of those four companies grew up with NTT, which they grew up with the buildup of the infrastructure in Japan uh, after the war. Hitachi has now uh, sold off their publicly traded uh, their public traded subsidiaries. The, the list is huge. The list includes Hitachi Koki, which was a, a mechanical tool company, Hitachi Transport, Hitachi Chemicals, Hitachi Construction, Hitachi Metals, Hitachi Kokusai. These were all multi-billion dollar companies, which Hitachi has now divested themselves of, and are, they're taking that money to redirect Hitachi. That's a huge change. I was on the board of Hitachi Chemicals, but also our private equity fund was involved with the acquisition of Hitachi Metals, Hitachi Construction, and Hitachi Kokusai. The whole process was first of all mandated by guidelines which came from METI uh, on how to respect the rights of third party shareholders. That is, Hitachi owned 52% of the companies, so those who own 48%, how do you protect the rights of those, of those shareholders? It was a transparent process. You can go to the website of each of those Hitachi companies. You can know what went on, when it went on. And the whole transformation took place without what I would expect in the American context. There were no lawyers who were trying to uh, sue on behalf of shareholders. There was a minimum of lawsuits, and it, 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 it went uh, relatively smoothly, quietly and smoothly. It's a huge trans transformation in Japan. But in a lot of cases, like Hitachi Metals was bought by a combination of Bain Capital, which is a Boston company, and us, which is a Jap Japan company. KKR bought uh, Hitachi Koki, for example. KKR bought uh, Hitachi Logistics. So there was the allowing of overseas, uh, overseas private equity funds to take those huge stakes in Japanese companies in the market. So it's another kind of globalization. I will say, that on the privatization of Toshiba, uh, our private equity fund was approved, whereas a UK-based private equity fund was not approved because there is in Hitoshi, in, in Toshiba a defense business as well as nuclear business and, and so forth. So, so it, it's, a, it's a huge change taking place in Japan. Uh, and I think it's a healthy change, and I think it's a transparent change, uh, and it's a sense. Now, I'll also say that 70% of our investment in our private equity fund comes from U.S. university endowments, with the leading being Yale Endowment, which is sort of the, the gold standard of endowment management. David Swenson, who unfortunately died prematurely about a year ago, but David Swenson was the, the person who really designed the Yale Endowment and their policy. In a discussion with Robert Rubin, who was Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton administration, Rubin asked David, where would you invest uh, other than the United States? And he said, well, you can't avoid China, but China scares me. He said, people don't understand that Japan is a prime area for investment. And Rubin said, David, why Japan? He said, well, Japan has all the strengths that Japan has always had, quality control, honesty, uh, little corruption. But the Japanese are discovering capitalism. <laughs> 
I, I took that dialogue and I sent it to my friends in, in METI to show this is the way that outside investors are now looking at Japan. Japan is, in dis is discovering capitalism. It might be a different form of capitalism, but I think it's happening. I, I, will, I will stop there and continue in the, in the discussion, but... Uh, Thanks, thanks, Rick. We'll come back um, to some of um, your dealings in China as well, because I know you're very active um, across uh, in China as well. Uh, Melanie, over to you. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Shiro. I think the 10th is terrific, and I started that applause before because I think it's well-deserved and very much um, uh, relevant. Uh, it's terrific to bring a bunch of people together, not only here in person in Canberra, for people to attend for the very first time. And I can attest to the fact that Rick had Vegemite for the first time today too, which I thought was terrific. Um, but also, I think it's wonderful that there's such a strong online community here here attending. I've had lots of comments from people already, so that's terrific and congratulations to the centre. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is that it's great to see so many students here. Um, something that's happened in the Australia-Japan relationship, in, in particularly in my case as well, is that uh, we're all getting older and uh, we really need to look at the next gen generation. Um, uh, you know, it's terrific living in Japan because my own definition of old has changed. Um, compared to Australia where at 59 I'd be really old, whereas in Japan, in the case of Mitsubishi Estate, I'm the youngest member on the board, which I just love, um, <laughs> being so young. That's diversity in my view. Um, so that works out very well. Um, it was, I was very interested to hear Urata Sensei's um, remarks about economic security, um, particularly because I know little about it, but live in Japan, so I'm experiencing a very different um, uh, experience, I, I experience things differently, I think, than if I lived in Australia. Um, the mood is different, the focus points are different, albeit that we've got great connection between Australia and Japan. But if I think about the threats to an economy, not only should they be considered in defence and security regions, which Mike's going to talk to us later about how important they are, but I really um, would love Japan to have another pillar, perhaps, and uh, look at perhaps that the threat to the economic threat that's posed to Japan because it uh, is unable to shift its policy around fertility, the birth rate, depopulation, and also the ageing population and how that impacts on Japanese economy. Um, I know that there were many scholars who look at this, so it's certainly not something that has been offered today as the first um, example of it, but I do know um, if we're going to look at uh, the change that Japan has to take has to consider. We need to consider the, the uh, importance of family and the services and that fl flexibility that's provided to the family such that um, people can consider having another um, child. Um, my, I have three grandchildren, so I'm already doing very well in Japan, thank you very much. Uh, but my, both of my um, sons would not consider having any more children because of the economic impact and the cost of having a child in Japan. The cost is also not measured in Japan Japan in terms of women's economic input, and this is a really important discussion that I think has taken place in Australia recently, led by a good friend of mine, Sam Moston, looking at the impact of economic contribution by women in terms of their role here. So there are lots of things in Japan, and I, I echo the comments made by Rick about the transformation and the changes that, are t that have taken place. Something that troubles me as an Australian is, well, lots of things trouble me, but uh, the cost of a coffee here, man, oh man, that's expensive. Um, but uh, the, Richard will know um, how we at the uh, AJBCC have worked tirelessly to uh, have more written about Japan in Australian media. Um, and how little there is still written. Um, uh, Shiro does his best with um, various comments, and I know others have been um, quoted this week. But we really need for the Australian uh, business people and Australians in general to understand what the benefits of their closer collaboration with Japan could be um, if we understand what challenges Japan is actually undergoing. And I think the comment, uh, the Bank of Japan um, overview um, is very interesting in that sense because it, it shows exactly where um, the role of women, the role of um, modern Japan, the role of innovation, and also your point about foreign direct investment I think is very relevant for where Japan is. Japan has changed a lot in the last 
five years, potentially, um, in terms of corporate governance, in terms of commitment to disclosure around ESG, in terms of diversity. And in fact, I look forward to the 11th of uh, September when the Japanese Prime Minister announces his uh, new cabinet or is suggested to announce his new cabinet um, because I believe that Prime Minister Kishida will follow the rhetoric. He has um, announced that 30% of women will be in uh, the senior management roles. So surely he should have 30% of his cabinet as women. Who thinks that's going to happen? Okie dokie, let's not do a poll here. But in any case, I do think that there's greater focus on the role of women and not just white women uh, living in Japan, because I, I think I know exactly what privilege is attached to my role. But we need to focus so much more on giving the roles, giving on a merit basis, as Kaisuka san said before about women at the B Bank of Japan, but we need to focus on ensuring that women are a key part of this next stage of Japan and that the flexible family practices that support that allow for men to take paternity leave as and when that is required. Um, the Japanese, uh, the Prime Minister has said that he would like 85% of male employees at Japanese companies to take paternity leave by 2030. Now that probably is a is very difficult to, to uh, push forward, but it is a change that has been highlighted and good on the government for indicating that that's the next step um, in their focus. Um, I look at the things that um, Rick has said in terms of the disclosure, the roles of the monoyu um, kigyo, the, the activist um, positions taken, and recently, of course, Norway's sovereign wealth fund in indicated that they will vote against Japanese uh, board nominations to Japanese companies where there are no women on the board. So that's a big move by um, obviously an outside group, um, but those type of gaiatsu style um, indications are important for Japan because they can be used as reference points for change. In my own case, I was appointed to the Sega Sammy board in 2019 and I was the first woman and first non-Japanese board member. Um, Mitsubishi Estate um, asked me to join and I was the first non-Japanese, but not the first woman. Um, Kawasaki Heavy, um, the, role, uh, the board numbers were increased and I am now neither the first woman nor the first foreign or non-Japanese. So even in a period of five years, albeit in a limited pool, um, that change has been something that I have seen. And the next board that I um, join uh, that hasn't been announced, but that I will be once again neither the first foreigner nor the first woman. So that, that's a great sign for change and how that takes place. Having said that, that, we have a long way to go. But we have a long way to go in Australia too. And I just mentioned, uh, Renee and I spoke earlier about the stat that was um, indicated in the fin today, that 82% of CEO pipeline roles held by uh, in, in Australia are held by men. So we really don't have the moral high ground to um, go to Japan and indicate to Japan what it should do. But together I'm sure we can think of service-based innovation perhaps that might help Japan in its digital transformation. There are certainly a range of different areas where I think we can do a lot of good work together and that hopefully that will fall into the economic security uh, part of this conversation. Otherwise, I've talked about something that has no relevance and I'll be booted out. <laughs> Absolutely not. Thank you, Melanie. Um, it's good to hear about the transformation of Japanese companies. That's, of course, going to be vital for Japanese economic security and living standards. And it's Japanese private sector that is navigating some of these um, constrained choices internationally, but, uh, but also it needs to get its own house in order domestically. Um, so I want to ask Urata Sensei about foreign direct investment and then come to Rick on semiconductors. I'm just putting everyone on notice. <laughs> Melanie on energy. We're talking about energy security in the Australia relationship. I think we can't leave that uh, untouched. And then I want to come back finally to supply chain resilience uh, before we open it up to, to the audience. Um, Rata-san, just on foreign direct investment, I guess um, two questions. Uh, one, a simple one, is Japan considering restriction of outward FDI like the United States is and like Europe is considering or the EU is considering? Uh, but the more substantive question, I think, is... Um, you argued for less restrictive um, policies towards incoming foreign investment in Japan. Uh, Japan has made progress, as you showed, 4.4% in 
now, stock of FDI relative to the size of its economy. Um, that's, from my understanding, second lowest in the world, just above North Korea. <laughs> Overtook North Korea five or so years ago. Becoming more restrictive now when uh, we need um, Japanese companies to be competitive uh, and for productivity growth. A, a question from me as a, an economist, um, to another economist of course, um, are these restrictive um, policies, are they solely focused on ownership and is that where the risk is? Because um, surely, as you mentioned, monitoring is very important, but uh, foreign direct investment has a peace dividend. You know, we call it the, um, it gives a stake in another um, country, in another company. Um, and if you think about just very simplistically, if you think a, a foreign company or country is going to blow up a bridge, why don't you sell it to them first? Right? Ownership um, can give a stake in another country. So does Japan have the power to confiscate assets, um, foreign-owned assets? Um, and do you think Japan's got the capacity to regulate not just foreign invested firms, but domestic firms from doing, doing naughty things? Okay, two questions, right? First one, uh, whether Japan, uh, Japanese government has any restrictions on outward foreign direct investment. As far as I understand it, well, Kaizuka-san may correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't think uh, uh, Japanese government has introduced restrictions on outward uh, investment. But there's a concern that the you know, outward foreign investment is hollowing out of Japanese economy. I mean, that, that's a kind of concern that some say, especially local governments have. Uh, but the uh, this one issue is whether outward foreign direct investment will lead to decline in employment in Japan or decline in the industry itself in Japan. Uh, and there has been some studies on this. As far as I understand it, there's no, I mean, connection. Or if there's a connection, uh, a connection is like this. Foreign uh, com companies which invest overseas are very active inside Japan. Right? In other words, uh, 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 foreign direct investment does not lead to uh, uh, lower employment in Japan. That, that's that's the uh, kind of one of the, uh, I think, uh, interesting uh, result of a study. But again, if there's a concern, maybe in the future, there'll be concern on outward foreign direct investment because, of, like the US, but so far, outward foreign investment is uh, well, uh, a concern for some local governments because uh, they uh, may see these outward investment as a source of loss of employment opportunities in that region. So, and on second, uh, Japanese government has a uh, uh, power to confiscate uh, the uh, domestic as well as foreign uh, uh, companies, right? Uh, yeah, well in Australia, we have the Defence Act, which allows the government to nationalise um, foreign investment, uh, foreign I, owned I, asset. I have to in check. The case but, of right. extreme measures. I, I think, uh, well, again, sorry, <laughs> I have to check the uh, rules. But uh, I, uh, I think all, all the government has that right or, or the uh, 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 power to do so, I'm sure. Well, and the Japanese government is no exception. If, if they find some investment or some illegal activities or unlawful activities by uh, Japanese firms, foreign firms. Uh, but again, uh, let, I have to check and let me report to you later. Thank you. Thanks, Surata-san. So, Rick, I, I didn't do you justice in the introduction. Um, you, you do um, have a lot of interests beyond what you mentioned. In fact, um, we're going to hear about some of those tonight in the dinner when we talk about the legacy of Ezra Vogel. Uh, Rick was Ezra Vo one of Ezra Vogel's first PhD students. Um, but um, you do operate in China a lot, and I know you worked with Ezra a, a lot in, in this regard, but in the semiconductor world, uh, I guess really what, I've got a large number of questions, but to start with, you know, how have Japanese companies responded to these sanctions, um, the US-led sanctions that the Japanese government has signed on to? Yeah. It's, it's complex because semiconductors, it's a complex supply chain. Uh, you know, I, I'm an American living overseas, and to see the partisan divide in America right now is, is 
heart-wrenching. But the one thing that all Americans seem to agree on is that China is now the enemy. Uh, and, and, and not only that, it's often the Chinese Communist Party is the enemy. And, uh, and that's not the way, I mean, J Japan worries about China, but uh, when, when you say the, the, the party is there, obviously the party is, is huge in China, but if there's going to be reform in China, in China, I think it has to either happen in the party or the party is the demise of the party. And I don't think we're gonna see the demise of the party. So by taking the party on like that, I don't see how the US gets an off ramp. But anyway, in, in, for some reason, in all of this, semiconductors have become sort of the target, uh, which has happened before in the United States. It happened, I saw, I, I've been in the semiconductor industry forever. It happened in the 70s, it happened in the 80s. In at both of those times, Japan was the enemy because Japan was becoming strong in semiconductors. For, for uh, Japan is no longer the leader in semiconductor devices, but Japan does have 50% of the market share for materials related to semiconductors. So Japan has the largest share of any place in the world. And Japan has 30% of the market share for equipment used in making semiconductors. The United States also has 30%, and the rest is sort of divided up with actually the Dutch having a big share because of of ASML in lithography. The, the United States and Japan has handled the situation very differently for, for several reasons. One, Japan beginning someplace in the early 2000s became disenchanted with China because of the anti-Japanese fervor. The, the riots against Japanese companies. I have a I have a, a home in Shanghai with a Japanese restaurant nearby. That restaurant got stoned, and uh, you know they were vicious. So I think beginning in the two thousands, uh, Japanese company, the Japanese government became very wary of China, but continued aggressively investing in China. The United States continued its sort of honeymoon with China up until very recently. So I think the Japanese were disabused of naivete about China long before the Americans were. And as a result, what the Japanese did in those cases was to hedge their bets in several ways. The largest uh, capital equipment, semiconductor capital equipment company in Japan is Tokyo Electron. Tokyo Electron manufactures their flat panel display equipment in China. They have never manufactured any of their semiconductor equipment in China. It's all manufactured in Japan. For the materials company, I was on the board of Hitachi Chemicals, which is one of the largest materials company. Uh, we manufactured in China, but in our factories in China for key parts of the process, uh, that was limited to Japanese engineers. And I used to go on audit of the Hitachi Chemicals factory, and I thought that they were discriminating against Chinese. Don't you have to do more localization? But they didn't. They would maybe have one or two key long-term Chinese employees in a critical part of the process. Otherwise, it was all Japanese engineers. And even during the heavy lockdown during COVID, those Japanese engineers stayed in China and put up with the with onerous lockdown in China. And that was true with, with most of the materials companies. So the, the employment in China of Japanese companies is huge, but in key parts of the process, uh, they limit that to, to Japanese to protect IP. The, with the American companies, especially the equipment companies, they manufactured in China, but they tend to manufacture through contract manufacturers, just like Apple uh, manufactures through Foxconn. And when you manufacture through contract manufacturers, that means you're giving your manufacturing know-how to the contract manufacturers. Now, a company that I worked for for 20 years, a Boston company named Teradyne that makes test equipment, they were doing all their manufacturing 
in China in Suzhou through Flextronics. And when it came time that even their shareholders were putting pressure on them to decouple, they simply moved from, elect from a Flextronics factory in Suzhou to a Flextronic factory in, in, in Penang. So it made it easier to decouple, but it also meant that they left behind a large number of, of Flextronics employees in Suzhou who could go to the local competition. So the Chinese are working as hard as they can to displace both the American companies and the Japanese companies because of the current situation. Japanese companies did the same thing when they were competing with the United States. So there's a lot of reverse engineering going on. Uh, and the pressure that is being put on the Chinese companies, I think in the end will just end up uh, making a duplicate supply chain of Chinese companies in the, in the industry. I also say that when the United States goes on th these things, and usually in semiconductor, all of a sudden the United States say, hey, maybe it's time we had an industrial policy. I mean, Japan has had an industrial policy for years, and Korea has had an industrial policy. So, the ja the, so, so all of a sudden you have the CHIPS Act, uh, and you're going to do more manufacturing in the United States. But the semiconductor industry in its evolution has been divided between the knowledge intensive part of the semiconductor industry and the capital intensive part of the, the knowledge intensive part is already in the United States. The capital intensive part is in Taiwan. And so now the United States is going to try to learn how to manufacture semiconductors it's no fun working in a semiconductor factory. How you're going to get Americans? Because you, I mean, it, it looks like it's clean. You have to suit up. You, you, if you go to the toilet, you have to take your suit off. You have to go. I mean, it's it, it it's not a great environment. How are you going to get people in Columbus, Ohio, to do that? I don't know. And in Arizona, TSMC is already having problems. Now, I'd like to say two things too. The Japanese, I think, Japanese companies in general are better at policing their IP because key in that process in China is Jetro. And so if you have the Japanese companies in Shanghai or Wuhan or wherever, when they have a problem, rather than going company to Chinese government, they go from the Japanese company to Jetro and Jetro to the Chinese government. The Koreans do the same thing. They've, they've copied Japan with Kotra. So you have nine Jetro offices all over China, and you have 11 Kotra offices that play that role in IP. The company that is ruthless at protecting its IP in China is TSMC. They will go after employees legally. They will stop them. They will. They will stop anybody from China who's who they suspect of ever getting into Taiwan. They are ruthless, because they they understand the Jap. The, the Americans have actually been naive. What, one other thing at the Jetro office in Shanghai, which is the biggest Jetro office in China, you go into the lobby. And you see this display of supposedly Japanese products. You, even you see Honda motorcycles, you see Yamaha, just Japanese products. All of those products are imitation. <laughs> and it's, the display is in the office so that whenever a Chinese goes through there, oh, by the way, here's what China is doing in imitating our products. <laughs> It's, 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 you don't see anything like that at the Department of Commerce office in <laughs> Shanghai. I mean, that's, that's, that's a clever way of, of, of managing IP. So. Is it possible then for Japanese semiconductor firms in the supply chain to decouple from China? I, one thing is what decoupling from China is, because the United States is putting pressure for the high end. But by the way, it's not the high end that is used in the semiconductors in missiles. It's 26 nanometers. It's not seven nanometers devices. It's 26. So 
there, there's, there, there are new restrictions from METI, and METI is trying to remain aligned with the United States. So Japanese companies, if they're exporting, will have to go to METI uh, to get licenses. But chances are there will not be restrictions for the, 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 the big part of the Chinese market, which is 26 nanometers and, and above. Thanks, thanks, Rick. We might come back to that. But, but, de but decoupling, uh, decoupling is more difficult for Japanese companies because they're, they actually have the factories. Yes. Uh, so, Melanie, we'll shift to the energy relationship. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's pretty well known to a lot of this audience just how important Australia is for Japan's energy security. And when we used to think of economic security in Japan, it was largely energy security. Um, you know, Japan relies on about 90% of its energy from imported sources, and Australia is about a third of that, so a rough rule of some thumb. And we're by far the most important energy supplier to Japan, uh, coal and LNG. Um, yet earlier this year when the Australian government introduced some uh, new policies around gas, um, safeguard mechanism, for example, uh, and other policies, you know, we ran out of gas on the eastern seaboard in 2017, had to buy it back from Japan at a huge price. Um, basically, policies trying to catch up with um, climate change action, uh, which we've been a bit slow on. Uh, this caused a pretty big rumble, um, may not have been too obvious to people, but it was on the front page of the Financial Review a number of times. You had the, the CEO and chair of INPEX in Australia saying Australia's gas policies threaten world peace. Thought that was a bit extreme. Um, but there were a, a large number of grumbles like that. What's happened here? What, what's the concern? We're still a reliable and secure supplier of energy, are we not? Why do I get this question and no one else in there? Um, I was born and raised in Western Australia. Um, so I have a very different sense of um, energy and resources, etc. It's a state that runs Australia, basically. Rick, don't worry. <laughs> um, you can see it hasn't come out of me, even though I live uh, in Japan for 30 years. Um, but it's evident to me um, how different the circumstances are here and in a state like Western Australia, and they are in Japan. Um, Fukushima has been mentioned today. Um, and of course, post Fukushima Japan, post Ukraine Japan, in terms of energy, in terms of um, threats that Japan experiences, are all uh, clear and relevant um, uh, parts of the Japanese psyche. Um, and as you say, the figure of the, re well, the reliance on Australia is very, very high. Um, I don't know that I particularly want to go into the um, nitty gritty of the concerns um, that have been raised and um, you know, in media, in using media too. So uh, that's something that has been quite different probably in, than in the past. But I would say that the pathway to net zero or that climate uh, sort of the transition um, for Australia and uh, also for Japan is very different because of those um, different circumstances. And it's a very complex pathway. Um, but it, it isn't something that is going to happen overnight. It won't happen with great, without great change and shift and, and transformation within industry and within a number of different industries. And so any shift to that is obviously something that's problematic and can raise a lot of concerns. Um, having joined um, Kawasaki Heavy, you know, I'm on a learning curve. I've only been there for nearly just over two months now. And uh, I just last Friday travelled to Shikoku and visited um, the hydrogen uh, sphere. I don't know what it's actually called in English, but, you know, it's the NEDO um, funded uh, hydrogen facility that is being tested um, for um, tank uh, manufacturing, obviously, in the future, uh, to carry liquefied ammonia, hydrogen vessel, you know, uh, back and forth between um, the various markets. And, you know, that's a 2.6 trillion yen investment, and it relies on collaboration between Australia and Japan. And it um, is going to work because of the strong connection between Australia and Japan. I'm very convinced of that. Um, but you can imagine that in that pathway, there will be different views and different concerns. And I think sometimes that we, um, as Australians so far away from Japan, um, uh, sometimes underestimate 
the um, proximity Japan um, uh, has to China, for example, and all of the um, issues that Rick has raised, um, it, and, and the China-US uh, um, uh, issues that are raised at the moment. So certainty of supply is obviously guaranteed, but I think we need to communicate better between uh, each other and not use the media. Well, the media probably is the last place that you want to have any of these issues raised. Um, so do we have um, stronger collaboration um, at government level in terms of regular um, energy dialogue? Um, do we have, um, do we institute uh, different structures that support that type of communication? Um, do our um, institutions become involved in learning more about what it is in fact that um, Japan is doing? And the other thing I think is really important to understand is that the role that METI plays um, in many cases, some, well, in some cases Australians might dismiss a particular company as pushing forward its own barrow on a particular product or a particular energy stream. But in Japan's case, it's an all Japan, almighty, METI driven, METI funded, taxpayer by me and you, um, led uh, initiative or discussion. So it's very important that we see it for its in, its, in its entirety. Now I've skirted around the issue, um, but I have, I do think that uh, increased dialogue and the Japanese expression about having your listening ears, yukikumimi or motsukoto, is important for both Australian side and the Japanese side. Um, and I think we'll probably be able to conquer it by um, listening more. Thanks, Melanie. Some pretty good advice as both countries decarbonise and there are going to be a lot more policy changes in both, both countries. So try to um, build up that institutional linkage much more to avoid stumbles and... and uh, unnecessary um, um, episodes. But let me open it up now. I promised a question on supply chains, but I might come back to that. Uh, I'll open up for questions, um, and not comments, questions in very short. So we'll go in the middle here, and then over here. Can you wait for the microphone? Can we run a microphone up here to the middle, just behind the camera? Jet. Jet. I have two questions. Um, I think there seems to be a recited voices for the Caprin saying market is big, but shouldn't there be more uh, voices, discussions, and uh, government policies to promote the uh, because of political risks? And second question is, uh, I think there are many more uh, tasks. Like I think Japan is not banning uh, foreign investment on buying land or a large source of land. Or there seems to be no counter espionage law because I, recently there was like uh, some foreign uh, technology transfer to foreign entity who was working in research institute. So do you think there needs to be some uh, measures for counter espionage? Thank you. Can I just take the very quickly the, um, on the issue of land? Um, acquisition um, by foreign nationals. Currently, there is no um, restriction or legislation that, that prevents that. Um, but at Mitsubishi Estate, in the, at the last board meeting, we looked at some of the um, ownership and purchasing data um, for mostly condominiums, you know, apartments in the um, Kanto region. And it showed that uh, at this stage, it's mostly um, uh, purchases by what they call in Japanese power kapuru, um, you know, individuals who are, are both working and who are buying um, higher priced apartments. And it's not necessarily that, that push in condominium purchases and pricing isn't necessarily driven at this stage by um, external um, sources. However, I agree that there needs to be um, some kind of register or at least some kind of restrictions in terms of what will happen. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, you suggest that the, there should be more policy kind of oriented discussions between other uh, across maybe countries like uh, Japan, U.S., Australia, and so on. Is that what uh, I mean to decouple from China? Is that what I think uh, the first point you made? And I, I'm sure that there have been discussions uh, in intergovernmental or across countries. Uh, and uh, well, that maybe that should be maybe enhanced more, but I, I'm sure that there are quite active uh, dialogue between 
uh, among uh, these governments, Australia, Japan, US, Canada, and so on. Uh, even if decoupling were possible without um, causing huge economic fracture and, and um, damage to all our economies, uh, is it even sensible? I, mean, I would have thought um, a China that is less integrated into the global economy um, would pose more risks. Yes, there are several or a number of studies which try to estimate uh, the cost of decoupling using economic models. And if I remember correctly, IMF has done that and the WTO has done it. Some, depending on how strict the decoupling is, it may lead to maybe 5 or 8% decline in world GDP. So decoupling itself is a very costly to all the countries, I guess, other than China, well, including China. That, that is, a, I think, a very important point to be made. So, so I think the, the, the kind of framing has shifted from decoupling to de-risking too. Um, Rick or Urata-san or anyone, do you want to tell us what de-risking means? I mean, in the private sector, surely you're, you're mitigating and managing risk all the time? Yeah. The, talking about systemic risk across the economy? Yeah. Or what, what, what's, there's a new euphemism in the United States for this, so, so offshoring, onshoring. Anyway. Uh, as I said, decoupling for Japanese companies is difficult, but I think new investments, large investments, uh, generally Japanese companies are just trying to stay clear of China. But we, we acquired Olympus's uh, camera business, and Olympus had actually uh, taken their entire manufacturing operation from Shenzhen in China and moved it to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. So all of the, you know, what we use for health, so it, it, was, it was huge. It was very difficult because the infrastructure in Ho Chi Minh City is not yet at the level of Shenzhen. You can't get the platers and the various suppliers, even logistics is complex, but they did it. And, uh, and so they, that, they, they, they decoupled. The, the other thing you mentioned, and I'm not really sure what is being done in Japan about this, but in the, like in the engineering and science faculties of most even national universities, including Todai, Tohokudai, Kyushu, Daigaku, at the, at the graduate level, a large number of the graduate students are Chinese. And, uh, and in fact, I think in many cases, you, you, the Japanese university would have a problem without the Chinese students. Uh, and how they protect the IP, which obviously you're, you're, you're training students, so they're getting the, the knowledge. Uh, is an issue and that I don't know how exactly it's being handled. At Hitachi Chemicals, our central research lab, actually the head of the lab, was a Chinese PhD lady. <laughs> uh, and very trusted uh, and, uh, and a, a valued employee. So. Thanks, we'll take two questions at once. Oh, yeah, start? go. Uh, first, you know, Japanese government uh, introduced, or METI introduced uh, several uh, measures to diversify Japanese investment out of China uh, to, uh, like, ASEAN countries, and all, that's one program. And the other program is reassuring. Uh, they provide subsidies to reassure, I mean, Japanese companies to reassure uh, their uh, activities away from China back to Japan. According to many studies, like economists, uh, agree that diversification is very, very important to de-risk. Uh, but the reshoring is back to Japan is not really recommendable because Japan is prone to earthquakes and so on. So putting everything back to Japan is not really a good policy. But to diversify, you know, investment away from, say, trouble like China to ASEAN. That's been, I think, considered very, very
favorable. Just one other point. Uh, Japanese Ministry of Education, I think, uh, asked the university to report the number of Chinese graduate students uh, to, to make sure that they know how many are in you know, uh, engineering and so on. And also, I didn't mention this in my talk, but uh, beginning in 2022, the Japanese government requires disclosure of information on presence of absence of foreign funding for government-funded research projects. So they are now more sensitive to these uh, uh, possible uh, takeover, I mean, acquisition of uh, technology by foreign-funded uh, uh, companies or institutions. Just, just before I go to the next two, we'll take two questions at once. Those subsidies for onshoring and the subsidies for expanding into Southeast Asia were taken up very quickly by the private sector. I mean, it seemed like it was free money. Um, I, my understanding is Japanese companies were already shifting to Southeast Asia because of higher wage costs and you know, $2 billion worth of subsidies to onshore flew in the face of $12 billion of Japanese investment into China in the same year. So the city is not that big. I mean, right, yeah. so it's an additional kind of marginal effect, not the uh, big. Thanks. So I've got a question there, Kent, and then Orbasan, oh, and then Helen. We're going to we're going to take two questions, get a quick quick two questions responses, and then two more questions, and then we'll wrap up. So yes, sorry. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mr. Tsuka from Keio University. I'm now a visiting fellow here at the NU. Uh, I have a question on the uh, economic security discourse, because uh, it seems to me that uh, there are uh, divisions and confusions, and uh, different groups of people are saying different things, and uh, there is a mutual sort of suspicions, complaints. Uh, for example, on the one hand, the security experts are saying that all oh, business people are looking only at money and complaining about that. And, but business people are saying that, uh, of course, business is business and business is important. So the, but uh, the business community and the econo e economists are no stranger to political risks. So the, you have been doing a political risk analysis and the country risk analysis. So what I'm wondering, my question is, from your perspective, particularly from economist perspective and business community perspective, what's the biggest difference between more traditional country risk and political risk considerations and economic security things? Because the, many companies are becoming more cautious about doing business in China or with China, but not for the sake of security and defense, but for the sake of business interest. So what's the biggest difference between traditional considerations and uh, economic security? Thank you. Thanks, Tsuroka-san. And Kent? Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for the panel. Kent Anderson from University of Newcastle. Um, we haven't talked about cyber security at all. Um, and thinking about my university as an operational entity, the risk of cybersecurity, both state-sponsored and non-state-sponsored, is much greater than the traditional economic security of IP. We, you know, we know what to do with IP. The cyber risk and the amount of money we're spending on it is much, much greater. The second risk probably is the one mentioned around um, just having a very diverse community of researchers and research students, and we do that through foreign interference, and we're getting better on that. But I would love to expand the conversation with economic to include the cyber consideration. All right, let's take those two questions. We'll come back for two final questions. Uh, let me first respond to Tsuroka-san's comment. I think it's a matter of degree. I mean, uh, you know, it's been, the risk has been there, for many years, but in recent years, as the China kind of uh, uh, emergence of China as a bigger threat, uh, that I think leads to um, great attention to uh, 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 economic security or political security. So it might be it's a matter of degree. I think uh, the nature or characteristics I don't I don't think have changed. Uh, that, that's my own personal view. About cyber security, I, I mentioned in my talk, but uh, it is very difficult, well, I think, to deal with, uh, you know, I think the government needs to really get control of, uh, uh, I mean, like information, so I, I don't know. I, you, you're correct about the increasing importance of cyber attacks. 
but I really don't know how uh, the government is, except that, that they're trying to deal with that, but uh, uh, that's, that's all I know, and I don't know exactly how they're trying to do so. Thank you. Either of you like to... Well, I'll just say that one of the, um, on one of the boards I'm on, uh, the, uh, an auditor, a woman, um, who was a former employee of, uh, the Ga of Gameshaw and the National Police Agency, um, she has been appointed because of her understanding of risk. And uh, so she um, uh, helps other board members and management understand the uh, changing nature of the risk, albeit that I agree with you, Ratas, and a lot of the risks are in fact something that's been around. But she has particularly picked up on cyber security, obviously, you know, in, in various places. Um, also, the discussion amongst the board, I think, changes to a degree by the nature of the board member um, and their area of expertise. Um, we're very lucky at Mitsubishi Estate to have the former governor of the Bank of Japan. Japan in Shirakasan, and he quite often speaks about the risk of depopulation in Japan. Um, and so I guess those, dis those, those risks are raised at the board level, how they impact on the board's business, on the company's business, um, to a certain degree by the various um, board members themselves. But it is open discussion and there is a key focus on the nature and the changing nature of risk. Mm. Rick, if you'd like to, optional. <laughs> well, on cybersecurity, I, I'm far from being an expert on cybersecurity. I just know that all of the organizations I'm involved with have gone to these upper levels, upper levels of cybersecurity, which makes it for the user, the user interface becomes extremely complex. Whether it's effective or not, I don't know. On the issue of political risk, and for example, when the water started being uh, released from Fukushima, uh, Japanese employees in China started getting harassed. And so uh, one company I'm on, they sent out a notice on what to do about the harassment that you'll get from your Chinese neighbors because you're Japanese and you're releasing this water. It's, it's I mean, I got calls on, to my phone um, from Chinese numbers um, complaining about um, Japanese about Fukushima. So, and in fact, the Tokyo, Tokyo Metropolitan Government in the first three or four days had 36,000 calls from a Bosch, obviously, um, complaining about the release of water. So, um, and to your point, Rick, I think a lot of the employees were told to uh, keep their Japanese-ness uh, uh, under the radar, right. like don't speak too loudly, don't speak in Japanese in public, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's some of the uh, greater issues, and of course the impact in Japan has been quite intense since uh, the release, hasn't it? You know, in terms of supporting Fukushima. Mm. Yeah, on the, some of the responses to the cybersecurity issues, Rick. I mean, some university IT security is so intense we can't use half the services now. <laughs> But um, we've got two questions from the audience, and I have one final question um, online, but first to Professor Orba. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Mie Orba uh, from the Kanaga University. Um, I have uh, two questions. The first one is a semiconductor. So now Japanese government tried to push and encourage the uh, domestic production of the semiconductor. So, but um, I heard that, that five big companies in Japan so uh, work together so and to to construct the one 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 company to push this project. But uh, taking uh, taking into account the uh, uh, Japanese company's business uh, company's ca culture, I think um, I'm I'm so doubt that this business uh, succeeded. So because, uh, for example, so the speed of decision making, so of the such uh, companies, there's so originally so the people uh, coming from the five companies and their own uh, business uh, culture. And then they, they merged into the one company, but so maybe the decision-making system is very different among them. If so, so but the semiconductor business uh, requires the speed and uh, a decision-making to, to invest a huge finance. So uh, if so, so I'm doubt. So how, to what extent, does such a business so succeed? So of course, I know the, the semiconductor is very important for the, the risking, but on the other hand, so I'm so doubt. So, so how, how do you think about that? So second question is that, so hydrogen facility. So yes, I'm, I'm so interested in this uh, new project 
So, but on the other hand, so the, we, we, are, we have to uh, consider the energy security. But energy industry is a business. So it means that the, um, energy, uh, energy business should be uh, promoted by the private company. So, if so, so they need the profit, stable profit. So do you think that the prospect of the, uh, the hydrogen facility, so it, uh, will it stand, will it, or can, can it stand as a business? So this is my question. And Helen? On, on sim Hold on, Rick, we might take uh, oh, another okay, couple. Okay. I'll be quick. Helen Mitchell, Australian National University. Um, thank you, panel. Urata-sensei offered us such a balanced, I think, approach to thinking about economic security, protecting against some threats, but weighing that up against, for example, in Japan's case, the huge benefits of inward investment. So my question is just where or if um, the Japanese government is weighing up these kind of economic security decisions. For example, are you aware that the um, national security team you talked about, Urata-sensei, uh, modelled on the US NEC? Is that the approach they're taking? Um, in other countries, for example, it tends to be more of a, a threat-based approach, a bit less of a consideration of the positive benefits and the peace dividend that Shido mentioned. So, so that's one question each, and just a final one from Professor Jenny Corbett online. I found the insights on the changes in Japan from Melanie and Rick very interesting. This is a corporate sector, I think. But I wonder if these um, changes make Japanese people feel more secure or less so. So one and a half questions each. Go ahead, Rick. <laughs> Can I do the um, Jenny Corbett? Hello, yeah, yeah. Jenny. Nice to see you. Um, uh, I think I think they do. Um, I think those uh, people who um, feel less than secure um, probably feel less secure for other reasons as well, um, their own um, merit-based um, engagement, etc. Um, so there are a lot of people who might feel threatened by changes, um, but it's how it's incorporated. Um, I also think that for such a long time, young people in Japan have been overlooked um, uh, as a group, and as they take on less of a um, I mean, in terms of voting, we've seen incredible commitment by young people in the last couple of elections. Um, but of course, the bulk of people are in the uh, in my category, <laughs> and so um, so it's skewed uh, to the to the older. But so I do think that people, uh, it's great for young people to see that there is a chance and that the change will bring them opportunity. I'll live the hydrogen one until I can think better. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. It's a you know, general, generational differences as to the uh, how they, they feel secure or not. Uh, uh, typically, of course, old people do not feel secure as the uh, more the foreign influence is uh, you know increased. But as I agree, the young people they are more acceptable to uh, uh, you know these changes or increased foreign presence in many areas, including companies and so on. So there's a generational difference. Yeah, and, and on the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, economic security issue, uh, NEC is the, uh, I think, the, like I said, uh, control tower, so to speak, of the issue. But the NEC consists of, um, of course, their own people, but the same time, like METI, maybe Ministry of Finance, uh, MOFA, they send the, their staff to NEC. So it's more kind of cooperation. Uh, but again, uh, as far as I understand, NEC and METI are very influential in uh, dis uh, deciding the policy regarding economic security in Japan. Thanks, Urata-san. Rick, a final word from you. Yeah. A couple of things. Oba sensei on, on semiconductors, I agree with you. I'm very skeptical. If you're talking about the new factory in Chitose S, uh, most of my friends in the in fact, my very good friend Koike san is in charge of that factory. Most of my friends in the industry are very skeptical. But TSMC has an amazing manufacturing technology, but overwhelmingly depends on the Japan supply chain. They depend on Asahi Glass, JSR, 
uh, Hoya Glass. The relationship between TSMC and Japanese suppliers is amazing. That has not even been replicated by UMC and other Taiwan companies. So I think that eventually the answer is the new TSMC factories in Kumamoto, because TSMC, TSMC has to find an alternative to Taiwan for various reasons. If, if that works in Kumamoto, and the local governments in Kumamoto, they're going to take 300 Taiwanese families to Kumamoto. If they can provide a welcoming home for TSMC, it could be that that will be Kumamoto. Yeah. Uh, and there's a strong relationship between Taiwan and Japan anyway. So there's a lot of effort going in to making Kumamoto welcome to TSMC, which is not working in Arizona, for example. I'd just like to make one last thing. You know, these changes and is it making Japanese... I, what Melanie talked about is trying to create gender diversity with work-life balance. And the problem that Japan has had is that men have sacrificed family life for the company. <laughs> And in a sense, that contract has not been upheld from the company side. And I'm, I'm on the evaluation committee for Jetro. Jetro has achieved 20% uh, bucho and above, female. But they've done it by not only maternity leave, but paternity leave. If only women take maternity leave, then they're looked down upon. But if men also take paternity leave, then it's equal. And the men love it. And they're taking it. And they, so it's the sacrifices. If you, if you have a company or an organization that is, has the right balance for females, it will also have the right balance for males and will be a better place to work. And I think that's happening. I think it's happening. In fact, one of the conversations we had with some Japanese colleagues last night at the embassy was about um, exactly that point. And uh, we, we indicated that, you know, quite often in the morning, um, I see a lot of men on their mamachari or papachari, shall we call them, or, um, you know, delivering the kiddies to daycare and, yeah, taking them, you know, left, right and centre. Um, but there are not as many men picking them up afterwards, of course, because it's harder to um, ask for um, permission to scoot off at four o'clock or to pop in to see the undo okay or whatever it is for men and that's why I think that young young people will lead that charge um, on the issue of hydrogen I definitely agree it has to be a business it, it is a business and it needs to continue to be um, uh, tonight actually to the Japan update we have our Kawasaki's newly arrived actually she's only a week in Japan um, who is the acting general manager for the hydrogen company that will work in um, Victoria and she will attend the dinner so maybe I'll ask you to talk to her about the actual business viability but in any case I think that um, the hydrogen uh, business in Japan is a koksaku, and however we say that in English, I don't know. So it has to be um, given, uh, it has to have that um, research and development and innovation push from government, but it must also have um, be viable. Otherwise, we're talking about... Um, and the same issue is being discussed in Australia. Um, if you read the paper this week, there's a lot of reference to whether, in fact, some of the green industries will, in fact, be viable and be, um, be uh, businesses that are, are, are economically feasible. So I agree with you. And I think the boards on these Japanese companies, or the, the boards of these Japanese companies, will be holding people to task. But what I do see, um, very briefly, in, in, in conclusion, is um, having seen uh, from Western Australia and Northern Territory the incredible shipment of LNG to Japan, um, to know that a, a Japanese company was uh, pivotal in the production of those LNG tankers, for example, um, that's the type of collaboration that Australia and Japan is, is terrific at. And those type of things need to obviously be, be supporting business too. Mm. Well, thank you, Melanie. That's a nice place to end. And the, the questions, thank you for the questions. They were dominated by men initially, but then we had three um, women at the end, now better late than never, and Japan's in the same space, I think, better late than never. Um, but I, I hope that was useful for you. It was extremely useful for me in trying to think these issues through. We invited um, 
economist, a trade economist, and two people from business, because I think this economic security issue has been kind of dominated by non-economists initially. Um, and we need to understand also what's going on in the ground, uh, on the ground, sorry, uh, with the company. So uh, I think it raised a lot of questions, um, legitimate questions we have to think through uh, instead of um, running full speed ahead with some of these policies. So uh, hopefully that's been um, as useful, useful to you as it has to me. Uh, and uh, again, please join me in thanking the excellent panel. Thank you.